Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. Well, howdy. Howdy. Um, I'm glad to be in church tonight. So, if you are new to Wednesday nights, I need to warn you. First of all, what this amounts to is essentially, for the next hour, a Bible study. And not just a Bible study, but an Old Testament Bible study. Not just an Old Testament Bible study, but a verse-by-verse chapter by chapter Old Testament Bible study. So uh, it could be like, you know, uh, too much to handle, uh, but just hang in there. If you're new to this, just hang in there uh, because I think you'll develop an appetite for it. And um, I know it's unusual. It's strange to say that, but it's, it's not a common thing to have uh, churches teaching through the Bible. I find it imperative, it's my conviction to do that. Um, One of the reasons is that Paul said to the church at Ephesus in Acts 20, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. He was with them three years and said that he declared to them the whole counsel of God. I don't believe a pastor could ever make that boast that he has taught his congregation the whole counsel of God unless he has taught through the Old and the New Testament. That is the whole counsel of God. So uh, it has been a commitment. It's not a normal commitment uh, for churches to make. It's really something that uh, Dr. J. Vernon McGee used to believe in when he was here on earth. Now, he's been in heaven many years, but if you know his radio ministry, he would take people uh, every day uh, on what he called the Bible bus, and he'd take them uh, through the whole of Scripture. He would read the whole Bible and make comments on it. And my pastor, Chuck Smith, sort of took that as his cue and said, I should do that for the whole church, and he did that. And then uh, we who sat under his ministry took that to different parts of the United States, And uh, I ended up here doing the same thing. So here we are, uh, once again, studying through the scriptures about our fourth time through. And we are in the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. Let's turn there. This last Saturday, I spoke to about 8,000 men at the Anaheim Convention Center in Southern California. And I spoke on being a man of God. And I found it interesting that there are 13 people in the Old Testament who are given the title man of God, and two of them are the two prophets that we have been studying. Elijah, the prophet, the last part of 1 Kings, beginning part of 2 Kings, and Elisha, the one that we are highlighting in these chapters the one who took over for the aforementioned prophet. Both of them are given that wonderful, noble title, man of God. Only one person in the New Testament is referred to as a man of God, and that is Timothy by Paul the Apostle. But we're looking at Elisha's ministry, and we have noted that it was filled with miracles unusual miracles. We remarked on some of those last week. We continue with some of them this week in these chapters. One of the amazing things about Elisha's ministry is what we read last time. There was a Syrian commander, so he was outside of Israel. He was not Jewish. He was a foreigner. And He had a slave, a girl who was a Jewish girl who knew about Elisha, and what got her attention is her master Naaman had leprosy. 
And she said, oh, if my master could only come in contact with that prophet down in Israel named Elisha, I believe that the Lord would heal him. So the king of Syria sent the commander of the Syrian forces, Naaman, think of it as um, like General Douglas MacArthur, that equivalent, all the way down to Israel with his leprosy, and he was healed. In being healed, and he was reluctant, you remember, to dip himself seven times in the Jordan River. When he was healed, he came out and acknowledged that there's only one God in all the world, and it's not the gods that he believed in, but the God of Israel. And so you read what he said when he came out of the Jordan River, and you have to conclude that he had a conversion experience. He came to believe in, trust in, and confess Yahweh, the God of the Jews. Why is that remarkable? It's remarkable because you have a foreigner who has more faith than the Israelite population themselves. The Israelites had forsaken God. The Israelites were worshiping Baal. The Israelites were sacrificing at the altars for these golden calves in Samaria and up in Dan. So the nation had turned away from God. Here you have a foreigner who comes to believe in the God that they should believe in. So you have Naaman, who was an indictment to the Israelites. And that's exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ said. You remember when Jesus went back to his hometown of Nazareth? And he stood in the synagogue and he read out of the book of Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, good tidings to the poor, bind up the brokenhearted, heal those who are in their captivity and blind. Then he closed the book and he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The Jews in the synagogue murmured and said, who does this guy think he is? We know this Jesus, we know who his family members are. He grew up here. And so they started challenging Jesus because Jesus moved from Nazareth to Capernaum, a Gentile territory filled with foreigners. And they said, hey, why don't you do some of the miracles here in Nazareth that you were doing up at Capernaum? And so Jesus, in hearing how they were spinning this, they didn't like the idea that he was ministering among the unclean Gentiles. He should be among the Jewish people. Jesus said this. He said, In the days of Elijah, the prophet, there were many widows, but Elijah was sent only to one of them, and that was to a widow in Zarephath up in Sidon. Gentile territory, a Gentile woman. Then he continued and he said, And there were many lepers in the days of Elisha the prophet. But only one of them was healed. And that was Naaman. And when he, when Jesus said those words, they picked up stones to kill him and drug him out to the edge of a cliff in Nazareth and wanted to throw him over. Why? What made them so angry? He was saying, these Gentiles put you to shame. These foreigners put you to shame. They believe in your God. Your covenant God, the one you have forsaken. You New Testament Jewish people, like the Old Testament Jewish people, are rejecting the very God that Naaman believed in. So Jesus picked up on what we read last week and used that as a heavy object lesson in his own town. When we closed the chapter last week, we noticed the contrast between Naaman, a foreigner, who becomes converted and healed of his leprosy, and Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, 
who because of his greed was given a sentence of leprosy. So one guy is healed of his leprosy, one is given leprosy for the rest of his life. Quite a contrast, quite a way to close the chapter. Well, chapter 5 continues with the miracles that were done by Elisha, the prophet. Now, what's the point of the author in bringing up all these different miracles, miracle after miracle? Well, first of all, they happen, so it's a matter of historical record. But number two, the greater point is that no matter how dark it gets, God always has a witness. No matter how bad it gets culturally, no matter how dark it gets politically, God always will provide a witness. And here the witness after Elijah's death, not death, but he was taken up into heaven in a whirlwind, is Elisha the prophet, very bold spokesperson, very powerful when it came to miracles. Now what I love about this chapter, and forgive the long introduction, but um, what it shows is that sometimes miracles happen with just everyday occurrences. Not that every occurrence that happens is a miracle, but in the mundane circumstances of life, God can work a miracle. It doesn't have to be some splitting of the Red Sea or a sign in heaven. It could just be, as you go about your daily business, the, the mundane this and that of life, that God can do a miracle. As we see here, a guy is chopping down wood with an axe and he will lose his axe head in the water and that's a very valuable piece of equipment. It'd be like losing a tractor today. And it was a borrowed implement so he feels bad because he has to pay it back and he probably didn't have much money. He's a son of a prophet so uh, he's in a real jam. But in just the normal, everyday, mundane circumstances, a miracle happens. Why is that noteworthy? It's noteworthy because just as Taylor said as we were beginning this, this evening in worship, he mentioned that there isn't something so small that you can't bother the Lord with. Oh, I don't want to pray about that. It's just so insignificant. It's so small. You know, I don't want to bother God with this. He's so busy running the universe and making sure the earth is spinning at 23 and a third degrees on its axis. That's heavy work. This is just a little daily worry. I don't want to bug God with it. No, bug God with it. God is interested in the mundane things. For example, who cares about how many hairs are on your head? Well, yeah, that's the answer. God does. I don't. I don't because it changes every time you comb your hair. Now, some of you have lost your hair, so, uh, you know, it's, it's an easy count. But <laughs> God has that number. The hairs of your head, Matthew chapter 10, are all numbered. A sparrow doesn't fall to the ground, but he knows. So those little circumstances of life apparently are important to him because a miracle occurs here in one of them. So verse 1, chapter 6, and the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, you remember who the sons of the prophets are. Some translations say the company of the prophets. Other translations will say the school of the prophets. It was a group of guys, like a Bible school, they gathered together, they sat under the teaching of the law, they probably were mentored by a notable prophet like Elisha or Elijah or Samuel the prophet. It goes all the way back to his era. And the Bible school was growing. If you remember, I'm just going to jog your memory. A couple chapters ago, chapter 4, there was a miracle of taking the loaves and multiplying them for 100 prophets that needed to be fed. So there are at least 100 prophets. And their number is growing. It's a good problem to have. 
So the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan, that is the Jordan River. Let every man take a beam from there, beam of wood. And let us make there, that is at the Jordan, a place where we may dwell. City of Jericho is not far from the Jordan River. They were in Jericho. They want to go a few miles east to the Jordan River and just kind of live out there in the desert and by the Jordan River and build the school of the prophets there. So, he, verse 2, he answered, go. Like, okay, go for it. Have fun. Then one said, please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. Elisha was easygoing. He said, go for it. Like, see ya, peace out, have fun. But they said, well, you know, why don't you come with us on this building excursion? So he said, okay, I'll go. And so we went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said, Alas! Alas is a, an exclamation word of disappointment, despair. Like, oh no! So he said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. It's not even my axe. I had to borrow it from somebody. They let, lent it to me. And the law of Moses said, if I lose something that belongs to a fellow Israelite, I have to replace it or pay it back with interest. So, bummer. It was borrowed. And the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. And so he cut off a stick and threw it in there. And he made the iron float. Therefore, he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and he took it. Now, do you have a problem with that story? Many people do. Oh, you can't take that literally. You can't think that that would happen. I mean, iron doesn't float. You're right, it doesn't. But it did. Well, how do you know? It said it did. I'm that simple. And here's why I'm that simple. The biggest miracle in the Bible has already been mentioned. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. If you can believe the first verse of the Bible, the rest of the Bible will be pretty easy and straightforward. If you have trouble with the first miracle of the Bible, you'll have trouble with every one thereafter. I believe my God created the world. I don't believe it evolved. I don't believe it was fortuitous occurrences of accidental circumstance. I don't believe enough time elapsed in the history of the world for randomness to be responsible for the cosmos that we enjoy. For me, it takes much more faith to believe it evolved than it does to believe God created it. And if you can believe that miracle, you can believe this miracle. But some people feel they need to explain it away. They say, well, probably what happened is Elijah threw the stick in and it happened to go right through the hole where the haft of the axe normally would go. It just happened to go there. Well, that, that sounds pretty miraculous in and of itself to be able to throw it in the water and nail it right through there. Or they'll say, well, he just took a stick and he kind of moved it around and fished it out and brought it up. That's not how I read it and I don't have a problem looking at this as a miracle. God made the iron float. And then it's, what's interesting to me is in verse 7, Therefore, Elisha said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and he took it. Now here's a question. If 
God can make the iron float to the surface of the water. Couldn't God make the iron float out of the water through the air and just land on top of the axe handle? Could. But he didn't. Why? There are certain things only God can do, but there are certain things you can do. God did what only God can do, made the iron float. He didn't have to go through all the histrionics and put on some kind of a show. Just look, there it is on the water. You can do that. Just pick it up, put it on. So oftentimes, life is that cooperation of the divine with the human, the mundane. Okay, God did a miracle. Now pick it up and and put it on the handle and, and go back to work. I love the cooperation here. Now, verse 8. This is where it gets fun. Not that the miracle wasn't fun, because that's pretty cool. But look at this. Now, the king of Syria was making war against Israel. Can I just remind you, the king of Syria is a guy named Ben-Hadad. You know that name. We've read that name. Ben-Hadad the first, followed by Ben-Hadad the second. Right. So this is probably Ben-Hadad II, the king of Syria. He made war against Israel. They had been allies for a while. Now they're adversaries once again. And he, the king of Syria, took counsel with his servants, his chief of staff, saying, my camp will be in such and such a place. And, here's the title, The man of God. Who does that refer to here? Elisha, the man of God, sent to the king of Israel, which is his name is Jehoram, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. The king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him, Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. So apparently, time after time after time, Elisha knew the plans of the king of Syria and told them to Jehoram, the king of Israel, because the Syrians were trying to ambush the Israelites. God saved Israel from being ambushed by the man of God, by Elisha, getting this word from the Lord, a word of knowledge, we might call it in the New Testament, and then telling the king of Israel. So it happened time after time. Therefore, therefore, verse 11, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called to his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Which of you guys is a spy? One of you guys here is a rat. You've been giving information out to the enemy, telling where my position is being set, where I'm amassing my troops to ambush the Israelites. One of you is a spy. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Hey, none of us are ratting on you, king. None of us would dare do that. But there's this prophet over on Israel's side and he tells you what you tell your wife when you go to bed at night. That's, that could be scary. He knows everything. God tells him everything. And he's been telling the king. And so he said, go and see where he is that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, surely he is in Dothan. Now, do you remember a couple chapters back in chapter 4? Remember that Shunammite woman who had a boy? The boy died. She went out to find him. Elisha could see her coming from the distance. He's on Mount Carmel, and she's coming, and he could read the anguish written all over her face. She was in deep distress. 
And she fell down before the prophet's feet, and Gehazi, the servant, said, you know, bug off, don't grab his feet, leave the prophet alone. And Elisha said, no, 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 leave her alone, she's in anguish. She's in deep anguish, and then he said, and the Lord hasn't told me what it is. Remember, I said, here's a guy who is so in tune with God that he is surprised when God doesn't speak to him. And I'm often surprised when God does speak to me. I'm delighted. I can't, I mean, God just really spoke to me. We get so excited. He, he, that happened all the time to him. So much so that when it didn't happen, he goes, hmm, God didn't tell me about this one. This is new. This is news to me. And so that's what this guy is referring to. He, he knows everything. So where is he? He's in Dothan. Dothan is about 12 miles north of the city of Samaria. Samaria is right in the middle of the country of Israel. Therefore, verse 14, he, Syrian guy, the king, ben Hadad, he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with the horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas! Remember what that word means? Oh no! Alas, my master, what shall we do? We're surrounded. We're done. We're finished. So he answered, Do not fear. That's what men of God do. They come in when everybody's scared and go, relax. God's in charge. Don't be afraid. Do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now just before I finish reading this little paragraph here, it says here, the servant of the man of God. We have to wonder who this is. Was this Gehazi? Because he was the servant of Elisha until the last chapter. The last chapter, he got leprosy. So maybe this is not Gehazi, that Gehazi is put out to pasture to be a leper somewhere in the outskirts of some city. He has to live that way. And this is someone else unnamed who is now the servant of Elisha. Or this is Gehazi, before the leprosy incident, and it's not in chronological order. That's a possibility as well. So I didn't answer the question. It's either Gehazi or it's not. How's that? <laughs> it's just the servant of the man of God. So he, he sees that he's surrounded by the army. He goes, oh man, we're done in. What shall we do? And he goes, ah, relax. Because there's more with us than those who are with them. What a truth. And Elijah prayed and he said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. In other words, the servant of the Lord, the servant of, the, of Elisha, sees the human army surrounding Dothan. Elisha prays, Lord, open his eyes that he can see into the real world, the invisible world, the angelic world, the spirit realm. The Lord opens those eyes, and now he is able to discern an army of angelic beings around the army that has surrounded him. So, at first, when you see the human army, you go, alas, we're done. But when you see the angelic army, you say, alas, they're done. I feel sorry for them. They're outnumbered. First, I thought we're outnumbered, but now I see they're outnumbered. Now, there is an unseen spirit realm. We live our lives, by and large, neglecting this truth, but it is a truth. I think if we were more in touch with that truth, we wouldn't fear as much as we do. You know, I 
do read the prayer requests that come into the church every day. And one of the frequent prayer requests I notice is to pray for so-and-so's mental health. It's a big prayer request. Somebody's mental health. And I always go to that scripture, God hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but of love and power and of a sound mind. And I claim that for that person. But I think we need to pray for people that say, I pray for my mental health. Lord, open his eyes. Lord, open her eyes. Help them see what is largely unaware to most of us, that there is a spirit realm, a powerful spiritual realm of angelic beings. Yes, God is with us. Yes, the Holy Spirit is with us. Yes, Jesus will be with you wherever you go. But also, there's a host of angels the Bible says in Hebrews 1 that God sends his angels to minister to those of us who are heirs of salvation. Jesus spoke about the angels of different people. Up in the New Testament book of Acts, remember when Peter was in prison in Jerusalem and an angel sprung him out of jail? And while he goes to find where the church is meeting, the Bible says they were having a prayer meeting. And they were probably praying that Peter would get released. So here he is. The answer to their prayer comes knocking on the door. Peter knocks on the door of the prayer meeting. A girl named Rhoda answers the door. And she sees that it's Peter. And she's so freaked out that she doesn't even open the door. She goes back to the prayer meeting and says, hey guys, Peter's outside. And they said, oh, it can't be Peter. Now here they are, Lord, we just pray and we pray in faith <laughs> that you'll release Peter from prison. Knock, knock, knock. Hi, it's Peter. Hey, Peter's at the door. Ah, it can't be Peter. <laughs> can't be that easy. And so here was their, their explanation. It must be his angel. Well, if I told you there's an angel outside waiting to see you, you'd all get up and go see if there's an angel. But, you know, it didn't, they didn't budge till Peter came in and, and relayed this. Anyway, back to this story. Here's an army surrounding Dothan. Now here's an angelic army surrounding the physical army. And he says, Lord, open his eyes. Just remember... You are surrounded by the angels of God, and the enemies that come against you are also surrounded. God's got y'all surrounded. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, and greater are those who are around you than even those who are around you in the world. That's why Paul in 1 Corinthians 4 said, we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary. The things which are not seen are eternal. So Lord opened his eyes. He opened his eyes and said, well, didn't say what he said, but it says the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, I just want to hammer that down a little bit for you personally. Some of you feel outnumbered. Some of you are outnumbered. You're outnumbered at work. You're outnumbered in your family. There's more unbelievers at work, more unbelievers in your family. In your daily life, you're surrounded by them. Paul said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Well, you can answer that. There's a lot of people against you. Satan's against you. His demons are against you. The world is against you. Some of those people of the world work with you, and they're against you. Some of those people of the world are in your family. They're against you. Could be your own neighbors. They're against you. But back to the question, if God be for us, who can be against us? In other words, if God is for you, who cares who's against you? Doesn't matter. And if we would come to this awareness more, I think our mental health would be stabilized. You would feel, fear not. 
There's really nothing to fear. There is an unseen angelic realm, and yes, Satan is alive, and yes, demons are around, but they're outnumbered. Two-thirds didn't fall. One-third fell with Lucifer. They're outnumbered. Live that way. Live your daily life that way. If you live thinking that, you're going to walk into every day without any fear. Doesn't matter who's against you. That's why Gideon could take a few hundred, 300 Israelites against 135,000 Midianites. Because if God is for you, who can be against you? That's why Jonathan could grab his armor bearer and say, hey, let's just you and me fight the whole Philistine army. What restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few? Let's just, let's just try it. It'd be fun. How could they do that? Because they lived in this reality. And I just want to encourage you, live in this beautiful reality of this unseen world. Uh, Psalm 3, David said, I will not be afraid of 10,000 who have set themselves against me all around. So many people are against me. So what? They're against God, and God is for you. Verse 18, when the Syrians came down to meet him, Elijah prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. So these, this is the invading army, the incursion army coming down the Syrians. Lord, he prays, um, <laughs> funny how he prays for his servants. says, Lord, open his eyes, and he prays for the army. Close their eyes. Blind them. Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to to the word of Elisha. Now Elisha said to them, <laughs> Elisha said to them, so here's the army, they come down, Elisha meets them, they don't know it's him because they're blind, they can't see him, they're just kind of groping in the darkness, so they just hear a voice, Elisha said to them, this is not the way, nor is this the city, hey, follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. Hey, you're in the wrong place. Guys, follow me. I'll, I know I know who you're after. Come on, follow me. So it was when they came to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes. And they saw, and there they were, inside Samaria. So they've been blinded. They're groping in the darkness. Somebody says, follow me, they follow him, they open their eyes. Now they're inside a walled, fortified city with soldiers all around in that city who are their enemies. When the king of Israel, that's Jehoram, when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, my father, a term of respect, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? Now, he asked the question twice, indicating he really wanted to kill them. <laughs> Can I kill him? Can I kill him? And he answered, you shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master." You need to know that it was customary in ancient times to kill those that you took captive in a battle. And so the king would ask, can I kill him? Can I kill him? Should I kill him? Should I kill him? Because it was customary to do so. If you fought a battle and you took people captive, it was just protocol. You kill the people you took captive. But the prophet says, don't kill them. Why? Because... Well, you didn't really win a battle. You weren't on the battlefield. You were just hanging out in town. I brought them to you. In effect, they, they surrendered to you. They were brought into this city. You really had nothing to do with it. So it's interesting. He says, no, don't kill them. Feed them. Bless them. 
show kindness to them, provide for them, set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Let them go. Then he prepared a great feast for them. And after they ate and drank, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the bands of Syrian raiders came no more to the land of Israel. In providing food and water for an enemy in ancient times was to make what is called a covenant of peace. It's something still practiced to this day. If you were invited into a tent, like in an Arab community, the sheikh would invite you into the community, you would be invited into the tent. If they break bread with you, feed you, give you something to drink, they make a covenant of peace with you, whereby they have sworn their protection for you. It's to make a covenant of peace. Now, it's an interesting way to treat your enemies, isn't it? It sounds a little bit like what Jesus said, but I say, do you love your enemies? Do good to those who despise you. Now, I'm going to read something to you from Proverbs chapter 25. And I'm reading it to you because it's a principle that Paul lifts out of the Old Testament and repeats. He quotes it in um, Romans chapter 12. So this is Proverbs 25. I'm reading to you verses 21 and 22. It says this, If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. It's exactly what Elisha tells Jehoram to do. For... So you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Paul quotes this in Romans chapter 12. He says, Brethren, do not avenge yourselves, but give place to wrath, for vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Then he quotes this, For if your enemy is hungry, give him to eat bread, If he is thirsty, give him water to drink, for in so doing you heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Now, what does that mean, heap coals of fire on his head? Well, in those days, in ancient days, especially among the Egyptians, but the Semitic people, when a person wanted to show that he was very contrite and very sorrow for doing something, he would put a little pan of coals, burning coals on his head, like put a little cloth on his head so it wouldn't burn his head, and then put a little coal with uh, a pan with coals on it. That was a symbol that he is burning with grief and burning with shame. And he's really, really sorry. He is in deep contrition. His guilt is burning a hole in his heart, so to speak. So he says, if you, if you have an enemy and you treat your enemy with kindness, you're going to heap coals of fire on his head. You're going to put him to shame because your enemy has been trying to hurt you, slander you, kill you. So bless your enemy, love your enemy, buy your enemy a meal. It'll blow their mind and they'll walk away feeling guilty and the Lord will reward you. Do you remember what David did to Saul when Saul was trying to kill him? David was hiding in a cave. Saul went in to relieve himself, used the restroom in the cave, all all alone. He didn't realize David was hiding in the shadows in the recess of the cave. David snipped a little piece of the garment of Saul off. Saul left the cave, went out into the sunlight. David chased after him and said, look what I got, king. You were that close to me, and I spared your life. And King Saul started weeping, and it said, You have treated me better than I treated you. I treated you like an enemy. You treated me like a friend. You are more righteous than I am. I rewarded you evil. You have rewarded me good. That's the idea of this. So that's what Elisha, using this principle in Proverbs, in Romans 12, this is the idea that Elisha is getting to the king of Israel. Be gracious, be kind. And the result is the band of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. 
So it really worked. It put them to shame. They were staying home. But that was then. Now some time passes between verse 23 and 24. Look at verse 24. And it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. So the band of raiders isn't coming, but now this fortified army, this official army from Syria is coming. So he gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. Now, I'm just going to throw this out. You can take it or leave it. I find it helpful sometimes to read some of the historical books that shed light on uh, Bible stories. Some of it may be true. Some of it may not be true. One of those sources is a guy by the name of Flavius Josephus, who wrote the history of the Jewish nation, uh, Old Testament stories, and through the time of Jesus, he even mentions Jesus. Josephus says that the reason the Lord allowed the Syrians to come against Jehoram at this time was because the king of Israel, Jehoram, was trusting in the fortified walls of Samaria. He's trusting that the walls would keep him safe. Not trusting in the Lord, but trusting in the ingenuity of the builders of the fortified walls. Hence, the attack. And, verse 25, not only was there a siege, there was a great famine in Samaria. Now stop right there. In the old days, and this will help, when, when, you, when you go to Israel with us and we take you on top of Masada, down by the Dead Sea, and you see this uh, fortified Roman city and you realize the Jewish people fled there at uh, one point in their history, uh, you look down around the hill of Masada and you see these stones that are in a sort of a square-ish circle in different portions. Those are the remains of Roman encampments because this is how a siege took place armies would come in surround the city like they did here in Samaria like they did at Masada they would build little walled encampments have the soldiers there and they would surround the city for weeks for months up to six months or more why so nobody could go in Nobody could go out. No food could go in. No water could go in. No supplies could go in. Nobody could leave. So they're stuck. So if there's a famine in the land because of sin, there's also a famine in the city. It's accentuated because of the siege, the army surrounding them. You get the picture. It's a very dire set of circumstances going on in the city of Samaria at this time. So there was a great famine in Samaria. Indeed, want to see how bad it was? Indeed, they besieged it. That is, they camped around it and wouldn't let people go in or out. They besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for about $500. Hey, how much you want for that donkey head? 500 bucks. You got a deal. Now, why would you want a donkey's head? Because you got nothing else to eat. Now, there's not much you can do with a donkey head, I'm guessing. You can make soup out of it. Um, no matter how you slice it, <laughs> sorry, sorry for the pun, uh, it's not an appetizing meal. What's for dinner tonight, honey? Donkey head soup. Would that cost you 500 bucks? Okay, cool. So it was pretty bad, and it was unkosher. It was forbidden to eat a donkey, but that's all they have left. So a donkey head was 500 bucks, 80 shekels of silver, and one fourth of a cob of dove droppings. That's about a pint of pigeon poop sold for five shekels of silver. It's how bad the famine got. Now some people, well some people, uh, the NIV translation doesn't say a cob of dove droppings, it says seed pods. It is believed by some that instead of the excrement of 
these birds that it was a reference to a certain plant that grew around the area called today, incidentally, the Star of Bethlehem, but it was these seed pods that uh, could be used as a vegetarian supplement uh, in, in times like this. So however you want to translate it, I, I think that it's probably just a pint of poop. <laughs> then as the king of Israel was passing on by the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord doesn't help you, where can I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? Look, what do you, I don't have anything either. I'm out. And the king said to her, What's troubling you? And she answered, This woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. And so we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, Give your son that we may eat him, but she has hidden her son. That shows you how desperate people were. Now, I'm gathering the sons had already died, but nonetheless, to resort to cannibalism, to make that the issue of the day, hey, we ate my son yesterday, and now it's, it's her turn to give up her son so we can have a meal today. That's what's troubling me. It happened when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes. And as he passed by on the wall, the people looked. And there underneath, he had sackcloth on his body. Then he said, God, do so to me and more if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. He blames it on the prophet. He blames all this on the man of God. Here's what you need to know. God had warned Israel that this could happen and would happen if they persisted in turning away from him, in sinning against him and forgetting the Lord God. God warned them. He warned them in the book of Leviticus. He warned them in the book of Deuteronomy. Now I'm reading Deuteronomy chapter 28, just a few verses. It's a long chapter. I've read it, sections of it to you before on Wednesday nights. The whole chapter has 68 verses. So um, in verse 47, God says to them, this is way back in the law, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, in need of all things, and he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. You, continuing in verse 53 of Deuteronomy 28, you shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and desperate straits which your enemies shall distress you. Picking it up in verse 56, the tender and delicate woman among you who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground because of her delicateness, you know, she's a, a woman of culture and sensitivity, will refuse to the husband of her bosom and to the son, her son and her daughter, her placenta which comes out from between her feet and her children whom she bears for she will eat them secretly for lack of all things in the siege and in desperate straits in which your enemies shall distress you in all your gates. Three times in their history, this happened. First time, 2 Kings, the passage we're reading. That's the first time. Second time, when Nebuchadnezzar surrounds Jerusalem and takes it in 586 B.C. The third time, according to Flavius Josephus, if he is to be believed as an accurate historian, during the Roman siege of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Those three times, the Bible on two occasions, Josephus on one occasion says that people resorted 
to eating their own children. And so the king heard it, tore his clothes. He's angry. What's interesting is in verse 30, he's wearing sackcloth. You know what sackcloth is? It's a black goat's hair. You know what it feels like? Really bad. Really itchy. It is intended to cause a rash, to cause a pain. It is a sign of repentance. It's a sign of remorse. It's a sign of turning back to God. But for this king, it was only an outward sign. It did not accompany an inward change. He just wore sackcloth, but he wasn't living sackcloth. He wasn't turning back to God. Why? Because he's blaming the prophet. It's Elijah's fault. I'm going to kill him. Elisha was the solution to the problem, not the source of the problem. But the king blamed the man of God, as happens in every generation. You and I are being blamed for the ills of America. America has gotten so warped, so backward, so left-leaning, progressive in its value and ideology that they're looking and saying, the real problem is the religious right. You're the problem. No. We offer the solution to the problem. You're mistaking us for being the source of the problem. So don't be surprised when these things happen today exactly like they happened in those days. He said, I'm gonna got to get rid, got to censor, cancel Elisha, the prophet. And he even invokes this sacred oath, God, do so to me and more if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. I'm going to behead him. Yeah, that's a repentant guy. But Elisha, I dig this, uh, I like this. Elisha was sitting in his house. You know, he's not worried. Oh, the king's after me. What am I going to do? He's, you know, Lord, open their eyes. I, there's more around me than, and around you. I, I'm good to go. So he's just sitting at home. And the elders were sitting with him. These are the other leaders of the land. They're conversing, no doubt, what to do with the problems going on in the land. The elders were sitting with him. The king sent a man ahead of him. But before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders. So the king dispatched somebody to go arrest Elisha. Elisha knew about it, right? He's tuned in. So before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, Do you see this? how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Can you believe this son of a murderer, Jehoram, was the second son of a murderer, Ahab? The king was a murderer, and this king is the son of that murderer. So uh, this is used in a derogatory sense. Do you see how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. In other words, pin him right in the door jamb. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? In other words, he sent the messenger, but the king's right behind him. And while he was still talking with them, there was the messenger coming down to him. And then he said, surely this calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Now, obviously, we're at the end of our time and we're at the end of the chapter. I did intend to do two chapters, but you are not surprised that I was unable to <laughs> deliver. However, we close on an interesting note. The king comes in, and who does he blame for the calamity? He blames God. He blames God. He says, surely this calamity is from Yahweh, from the Lord. And then he says, why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Now, this is, this is information. Apparently, Elisha had told Jehoram, the king of Israel, sit tight. 
I know the king has besieged you, the king of Assyria, of the, of, of Syria, and the Assyrian army is all around you. Don't do anything. Just wait it out. Wait on the Lord. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. Just wait. Don't do anything. Apparently, that is the directive Elisha gave to the king of Israel. King of Israel is done waiting. Like so many of us, it gets so hard to wait on the Lord. We want to take matters into our own hands. This is God's fault, and I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to wait for God any longer. It's a mistake. It is a discipline to wait on the Lord, but those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. Some of you are waiting on the Lord, and you've been waiting for a long time. Don't take matters into your hands. Wait for the Lord's deliverance. Doesn't mean you should be inactive. Go when the Lord says go. If you're at a stoplight, if there's not a green light, stay there. Um, if you don't know if it's a red or a yellow, wait till you know it's a green and then go. So God can change things in an instant as, unfortunately, we're not able to see tonight, but we will see next time. In one day, the entire problem in Samaria, the entire issue of the famine and the high food costs is completely turned around instantly. God can do that. Be, be far better for the king to just cool his jets and wait. Father, we want to close with that. Some of us are getting antsy, getting restless. We want to move. And Lord, I just pray you'd give us discernment to know when to move, when to stop, when to rest, at what pace we should move, when we should wait for you for the axe head to float, and when we should reach out our hand by faith and grab it and do what we can do. We want there to be a cooperation with your work, but I pray we would be gifted to discern and see into the spiritual realm because there are more that are on our side than those that are against us. We have the angelic hosts of heaven, a great cloud of witnesses. We have believers around the world praying for us. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, Jesus walking with us, the Father guiding us. And if God, if you are for us, we really don't care who's against us. It's sufficient for us to know that you are for us. I pray that we would ever seek you and wait for your deliverance. In Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.